Let me know if this sounds familiar. A company holds an event. They announce a crazy, innovative smartphone. You see this thing plastered across the internet for the next few days. But then, nothing. It just disappears off the face of the planet. Gone. You don't see it in stores. You don't see any more long-term reviews. That's kind of it. So I'm going to be telling you why these phones keep failing and how I think they can be made to not fail. It all boils down to impatience. If you look at the companies that are selling well in the smartphone market, the common theme is that they build good phones, not crazy phones, not even necessarily the most exciting phones, but just well-rounded devices. Now, that is easier said than done, especially for a new company. And even if you're able to do that, it could be years before you're in the limelight and you're getting good media coverage. So many companies turn to the alternative Let's build something crazy. It could be a holographic display, it could be a fully integrated gaming controller, or it could just be sticking an 18,000 milliamp hour battery inside. This kind of experimentation is exciting for consumers to look at, and so it makes sense for the media and for YouTubers to cover it. A company can shoot straight to the top of the news just by being different. You might remember that massive Energizer smartphone I covered. That video is on nearly 5 million views, and all it is is a quick look at the device. That's almost definitely more exposure than I'd get for covering a Samsung flagship or even an iPhone. It's kind of amazing then that a phone with this much interest, when listed on Indiegogo, achieved a grand total of 15 backers, less than 1% of what the company's goal was. And so, the problem is that whilst people talk about crazy, people even share crazy, people don't buy crazy. You see, innovative smartphones, let's take the Asus Zenfone 6 as an example, they're risky. To be innovative, a phone has got to be doing something that nobody else is. And in a lot of cases, there's a good reason why they're not. Innovative smartphones are more likely to go wrong and more likely to just run into completely unforeseen issues than if you just took last year's offering and made it better. This is going to seem like a strange example, but bear with me here. Buying a smartphone smartphone is very different to buying, let's say, a meal. When you go out and order food, most people aren't afraid to experiment. You might end up with a completely new, amazing experience, and even if it's a mistake, you just don't order that food again. The difference when it comes to buying a smartphone is that most people can't afford to make a mistake. They are not only far more expensive than food, but an average consumer is going to buy one phone and it's got to last them at least two years. And in that time, it's going to be a central part of their life. So because of this, when consumers are buying phones, they are risk averse, or in other words, unwilling to take a chance. I think a lot of new phone companies get a bit carried away with how we're going to make ourselves stand out. And they kind of forget that the bigger questions buyers are worried about are things like, is this phone going to get updates? Is it going to be easily repaired? How can I make sure that it's not going to break over time? One of my most asked questions is, why why do I use the Galaxy S10 5G? I could have picked the Asus ROG Phone 2, which is faster. I could have picked the Huawei P30 Pro, whose camera I prefer. Or I could have gone for the Asus Zenfone 6, which takes better selfies. The answer to that is that the S10 5G is the most well-rounded, and more importantly, hassle-free phone I've used. My phone is so important to me that I'd be willing to have a slightly less exciting experience if it meant that I had peace of mind. And this is the general attitude of consumers. They're not willing to try something that's better, just in case it's not. And it actually works both ways because companies are risk averse too. Chances are when you see one of these crazy innovative smartphones, it'll either be made by a company that is completely new to the smartphone market and so has less to lose, or it'll be produced by one of the big smartphone makers, but under a more obscure sub-brand. All right, imagine you're Samsung. Your biggest launch of the year is your Galaxy S series, where you just know you're gonna get high volume, reliable sales. Long story short, you've got no reason to ruin a good thing. Let's say for one of these phones, you decided to try something different and you ended up releasing something that was quite interesting but ended up being a little bit unrefined, you risk damaging the Galaxy S brand. If something went wrong to a sideline Galaxy A series phone or a smartphone that's in a completely new sub-brand of its own, then the actual core Galaxy S brand is still somewhat protected. So it makes sense for the innovation and the experimentation to be reserved for the phones that don't matter as much. This becomes a vicious cycle. If companies are only willing to experiment and try new things on their low-key sub-brand phones, which they don't don't promote heavily, and then consumers are only willing to buy mainline, highly promoted devices because that's what they trust, then right out the gate, the most innovative smartphones aren't even being given a chance to succeed. And so, for a quick example of how to enter the smartphone market done right, 
let's take a look at OnePlus. When OnePlus came to market, they were a nobody. Two founders, they didn't even have trust on their side, and they had to grab attention somehow. Now, I think the wrong way of doing this would have been to try and throw all your resources into one killer feature, to make something that really stood out, that really grabbed headlines. But OnePlus did the right thing. They didn't build a crazy phone. The OnePlus One was a really standard flagship phone by a lot of metrics, but they still managed to get that media coverage through a crazy low price and smart marketing. Now that the media was paying attention, all they had to do was just keep making better versions of this. And five years later, some people are buying OnePluses over iPhones. As a final note, it's worth clarifying that I'm not saying that innovation is dead. And in fact, the way this market works ends up also flushing out a lot of the useless innovation. But my point is that those really out there devices, you could call them innovative, you could call them cutting edge, you could also call them gimmicky. These do not succeed. And with that being said, thanks a lot for watching and I will catch you in the next one.